Thank you for that, James. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. I have to say, the last five years have been a very, very steep learning curve for me. I thoroughly recommend it to any of you. It's been perhaps some of the most exciting five years of my career. It's, it's uh, a really interesting experience. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenge of Alzheimer's disease. And it is a really, really big challenge. I don't need to tell you that. Um, but I want to explain to you why I think biomarkers uh, are the solution. And um, I really do think that. I think one of the reasons why we've not made as much progress as other therapeutic areas have over the past 10 or 20 years has been the relative absence of biomarkers. And that has changed. In fact, it's changed beyond my wildest dreams. And I'm sure many of you share that. And I'm really hopeful for the future. Now, obviously, uh, in terms of conflicts, uh, I work at Janssen now, where I lead uh, the neuroscience discovery and translation teams in the US and Europe. Um, and that's pretty much my only conflict these days. So if I think about what the challenge, there's loads of challenges for Alzheimer's disease. You know, we could, go, we could spend the rest of the morning talking about the challenges from funding through to stigma, through to lack of recognition in the community. You could go on for quite a long time, but I think there are only three that are really material that have prevented, our, uh, prevented even more progress than we've made so far. And they are this heterogeneity or heterogeneity of Alzheimer's disease, it's extraordinary. There's a very long pre-dementia phase, of course, which I think represents the most extraordinary opportunity because it means that for Alzheimer's disease, we have a real prospect of prevention, not primary prevention, but secondary prevention. I think it is within our grasp. It's a fantastic opportunity, but it's equally and obviously an amazing challenge. And I think many of the uh, trial failures, we don't know whether the drug failed or whether the clinical trial failed because of this problem about the long prodromal period and when to treat. And I think the clinical outcomes are variable. Some of the most intense arguments in the field are about which cognitive scale to use in a clinical trial. And the reason why those arguments are so intense is because they're all a bit rubbish. It's not the tests that are rubbish, of course. It's that it's intrinsically difficult to measure the outcomes that are important to patients. And I think in each case, biomarkers are the solution. So what I'm going to do in this talk, which probably is going to last for about an hour and a half, unless, James, you stop me, um, is first of all, I'm going to explain a little bit more about what I mean about why biomarkers are the solution. And then I'm going to tell you about what we're doing in Janssen and how we're using biomarkers in our leading clinical trials. And then I'll say a little bit at the end about where I think the gaps in biomarkers work are and some of the initiatives that are going on, three in particular, that I think might uh, provide some of the solutions or fill in some of those gaps. And there's going to be lots more gaps, lots more things to discuss, lots more challenges of getting these things into the clinic, so for the speakers that follow me, I can assure you I'm leaving lots of space for you here. So the challenge of heterogeneity, it used to be so simple. It used to be that the big neurodegenerative diseases were Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and then there was also frontotemporal dementia and neuroimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis that were a bit different, and these were quite separate diseases. And then the world became increasingly complicated. Of course, Newcastle started it all with dementia with Lewy bodies. And then we realized that there's actually an overlap between Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease with dementia with Lewy bodies somewhat off towards the sides. But these are overlap conditions. In the last, what is it, two years, we start to think that ALS or motor neuron disease also overlaps both with frontotemporal dementia through tau and through Alzheimer's disease because it turns out that outside, a significant proportion of people we think have Alzheimer's disease also have TDP43 pathology. And increasingly, we're realizing that much of Alzheimer's disease and indeed Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders are part of a neuroimmune complex. 
And so I think we're moving to a space where we recognize synucleinopathies, tauopathies, TDP43 disease, neuroimmune disease. I think we're moving to the point where we are this far away from describing a molecular anatomy of neurodegeneration, a pathological classification of these diseases. And the drugs are based on molecular pathogenesis. They're not based upon diagnostic categories that have served us fairly well for a little over 100 years, but will not serve us so well for the next 100 years. We're also beginning to, well, we're making great progress as a field in having biomarkers that describe these molecular pathogenesis. So the table that you see uh, on your right-hand side there shows you know, my sense of where we are in deep red and where we're going in the lighter shades of red with um, molecular biomarkers, including imaging and fluid phase biomarkers, and underneath that, um, I've, I've put underneath that where we actually have them with ticks, and the uh, synuclein ones with parentheses, I think, from what I see of the field developing, we're very likely to have molecular markers uh, of those within 12 to 18 months that we can begin to use in our clinical trials. It's quite extraordinary. So we're getting to the phase where patients will only enter clinical trials if they have the pathogenesis for which the drug is designed. In the rest of medicine, I have to say, it would be extraordinary if it was anything other than that. And when my colleagues in other therapeutic areas hear that in some of the massive clinical trials, or at least massively expensive clinical trials that have taken place in the field, 20% or more of the people that enter those clinical trials don't have the pathology that the drug was designed against, they look askance as well they might. So biomarkers most definitely the solution to heterogeneity, and we're actually on the cusp of doing that for the whole of neurodegeneration, not just Alzheimer's disease. The challenge of pre-dementia disease is, as everybody in this room obviously knows, there's a very long period of decades before the dementia is apparent. It's a bit questionable where the bit in the middle is, you know, that we used to call mild cognitive impairment. Increasingly, we call prodromal disease. Um, often patients know that they're in that phase of condition. The problem is, of course, differentiating the patients who know that they uh, have something wrong, uh, differentiating those who are right because of pathology and those who have some other reason for feeling that there's something wrong. It's a difficult task for a clinician to do. And everybody's very familiar, of course, with the Clifford Jack curves, which were um, amazingly prescient, it turns out, because the biomarkers are following those curves pretty well. And of course, now with the biomarkers, we're in the position where we can say in the prodromal phase, and we're beginning even to be able to say in the preclinical phase, and I'll come back to that, which people in those phases actually have the twin key pathologies of Alzheimer's disease. And looking ahead, I see a time when we'll be able to get really precise and we'll be able to say in the prodromal phase, for sure, maybe even in the preclinical phase, whether people have amyloid or tau or whether they have a bit of... Um, synucleinopathy, or maybe even TDP43 pathology, maybe even vascular pathology quite accurately. And we'll be able to ascribe people to trials of multiple different agents geared to the pathology that they have. That's what happens in oncology, and I think that's the path that we're heading to. But today, we can do it for Alzheimer's disease at least to identify the positive pathologies. What we're not so good at doing is saying what other pathologies people have. And finally, the challenge of clinical outcomes. It's really sobering when you look at test, retest, reliability of cognitive scales. So I've put up some data here from the literature um, for the MMSE. Typically, it's felt in the field that about four points change on the MMSE is about the range that is clinically meaningful. 
the test retest variance in the MMSE is four points. Now, you know that we're in a, tr we're in a difficult situation where the clinical benefits that you expect are within the same sort of range as the test retest variability. It makes it, I think this is cautious understatement, it makes it very difficult. Now, you could argue, you're probably all thinking, yeah, but that's the MMSE, what about the ADAS-COG or the R-bands or whatever your favorite test is? And of course they are better than the MMSE, but the fundamental problem, which no test can, um, no test can mitigate completely, is that cognition varies. You know that. You have a bad night's sleep, you haven't had enough coffee, you're distracted by something else, your cognitive performance changes. You've all experienced that. Why wouldn't you expect your patients or your participants in clinical trials to experience that? So I'm not saying that cognition is not an important outcome. It is. I'm just saying it's very difficult to measure. That doesn't apply to many of the biomarkers, which are fairly, um, fairly stable on test-retest. So an example here for um, PET imaging, for example, the test-retest uh, variability is tiny, really tiny, in the region of around 5%. And so I think that by shrewd combination of clinical outcome measures, which remain primary, and biomarker measures, we can mitigate some of the problems of the challenge of clinical outcomes. So I think biomarkers are not only with us, but they're solving some of the big problems of clinical trials. Now I want to turn to uh, trials that we're doing, our leading clinical trials for us, our, our anti-tau trials. Um, and they're based on this hypothesis of what's happening in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. At the top, the blue brains, you see a cartoon of the changes that occur in amyloid pathology. So as the disease progresses from the preclinical phase to the prodromal phase, amyloid has already happened. So amyloid pathology, the aggregation of amyloid, uh, what we can actually measure using PET imaging uh, with plaque load has pretty much uh, reached a plateau. Tau pathology is different. Tau pathology, a certain amount of aggregated tau in the entorhinal cortex is, uh, appears pretty universal and normal for aging. It happens. But escape, to use a word, it's not really escape, but spread of tau pathology from the entorhinal cortex to the rest of the brain is a pathological event that is very clearly associated with clinical progression. And it spreads in a very characteristic way that Brach and Brach described. It is a hypothesis. But it is, to my mind, a very likely hypothesis that amyloid is involved somehow through a mechanism we really don't understand in the propagation of that tau pathology. As you all know, increasingly over the last five or ten years, the spread of tau has been associated with an extracellular or templating process where tau pathology escapes from one neuron and spreads to the next neuron and by promoting aggregation. Now, the preclinical evidence for that, the pre-human animal model experiments, both in vitro and in vivo, are extraordinarily powerful. They, they are uh, very consistent. That looks to be a really good hypothesis. I'm just emphasizing this point because it remains a hypothesis until it's proven, and the only way of proving it is through an appropriate clinical trial. I think we and many other companies are doing those appropriate preclinical trials. So we have two compounds in clinical development. We have passive immunotherapy and we have active immunotherapy. So passive immunotherapy means a monoclonal antibody that is in late development phase. We also have, in partnership with AC Immune, an active immunotherapy approach. The active immunotherapy approach is in early uh, phase development. Now, our uh, passive immunotherapy is targeting 
The earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease are that sort of prodromal early Alzheimer's disease interface. The active immunotherapy in early uh, clinical development is subject to change. So obviously it would one of the areas that we uh, might think about developing it in late development would be in true preclinical. I'm just emphasizing this is subject to change. It's in early development. We'll learn from our clinical trials and make decisions when we approach late stage development. So, how are we using biomarkers? In Janssen Neuroscience, over the last few years, we've instigated a policy where there is no compound in the whole of neuroscience which we will have in either preclinical or clinical development that hasn't given proper and due consideration to biomarkers. Now, that doesn't mean we'll have no trial, you know, no compound, no portfolio entry without a biomarker but it's very strong pressure on the clinical teams and preclinical teams to come up with a biomarker. And there are multiple different biomarkers that we're interested in. We're interested in biomarkers that help define the patient, so selection, stratification, recruitment, all of that kind of thing. There are biomarkers that help determine the drug's efficacy. That includes target engagement biomarkers. And there's markers that measure response, benefits, differentiation between our compounds, which would be the best compound to progress those kind of biomarkers. Now, some of those biomarkers could, in the future, of course, get close to being or even become a surrogate biomarker. But true surrogate biomarkers are very, very difficult to achieve. Our biomarkers for the TAU program are obviously based upon the framework, the ATN framework, that we've all come to uh, uh, come to accept. I think it's a great advance for the field. I look forward to the time, as I said earlier, to when we not only have ATN, but ATN-T for TDP43, ATN-S for synuclein, ATN-NI for neuroinflammation, etc., etc. But for now, we've got very good markers of ATN. And our biomarker-driven approach for precision in our TAU trials is to aid in particular, the patient selection and stratification and to monitor disease progression. I'll now show you how we're doing that. So I don't want to get into an amyloid versus tau discussion. We've had enough of those over the last 30 odd years, but it is somewhat instructive to look at um, amyloid and tau biomarkers. And this illustrates the point that I think I've already made on the top. There is the tau pet, and on the bottom, there is the amyloid pet. And you can see that amyloid load, as measured by the most specific biomarker of molecular imaging, reaches a plateau pretty much in the sort of late preclinical phase. Whereas tau, and obviously this is somewhat selective in terms of the images I've shown, but there is actual data to support this, you can see that escape from the entorhinal cortex and then the brach and brach spread through the brain as the disease progresses. This would make you think that looking at serial tau might be more informative about disease progression than looking at serial amyloid in the prodromal phase. And that sort of appears to be the case. If you look at amyloid imaging on your left-hand side, the amyloid imaging is incredibly predictive of what happens to patients. So if you start with a high amyloid load, you're much more likely to progress. Obviously, that's very good for a clinical trial. You might want to select people who have high amyloid load, all other characteristics being the same, because they're most likely to progress in the time period of a clinical trial. You might want to do that. There are some reasons not for doing that, by the way, but for now, it's not a bad strategy. So there's a very clear relationship between baseline amyloid and progression. That is also actually true for tau, but what tau does as well, it shows a very good correlation with progression as it happens. You can see the tau pathology using PET move as the cognition declines. So tau PET gets worse, you get more tau pathology as your uh, cognition gets worse, which is not quite the same for amyloid. 
So uh, one of our important outcome measures is serial tau pet. Now, first of all, we're selecting people with the right amount of tau for our clinical trial, which I should have said earlier, by the way, is called autonomy. This is the trial of the tau monoclonal, the passive, um, uh, the passive immunotherapy trial, which is well underway right now. We're not choosing people with no tau pathology. People with no tau pathology are going to take a very long time to acquire tau pathology. We're not choosing people with very widespread tau pathology. By the time you've got widespread tau pathology, it seems to me there's not much point in giving a passive immunotherapy. It's not likely to reverse established tau pathology. So if you think about that in molecular terms, you see what, the, what an immunotherapy can do is prevent the spread of tau because there's a pathological process happening in the interstitial space between neurons where the antibody will get to. Once the pathology is in that neuron, that neuron is probably doomed to progression and eventual neuronal death, no matter how much immunotherapy you apply. That is a hypothesis. Again, it's a hypothesis that's very likely to be true. It doesn't mean we can't develop intracellular anti-tau pathologies. It just means for especially passive tau immunotherapy and probably active tau immunotherapy, you're looking to prevent the between neuron disease, the interstitial spread of tau pathology. So you do need to get people before it's spread too far. So for the autonomy trial inclusion range, we're choosing people who are most likely to benefit, and we've defined that using TAUPET. We're also using TAUPET to track TAU pathology, and my close colleague, uh, Hartmut Kolb, who's in our biomarker, who leads our biomarkers group, has over the last few years done some outstanding work to develop a method for tracking tau pathology using tau pet. You can see here this is um, imaging of a patient, it's real data, and the blue in effect is the baseline tau pathology, and the red is the spread of pathology uh, over a period of time. And so clearly that red element is the sort of thing one would look for if you want to see an effective compound preventing the spread of tau pathology. Moving on somewhat, how can the biomarkers help to recruit to clinical trials? And this is, for me, somewhat sobering. This is uh, data from Risa Sperling's paper. Uh, many of you will know this paper very well. This is looking at a pre-symptomatic population. How many people in a pre-symptomatic pathology have got the sort of pathology that we would want to recruit to a clinical trial? So I said in our um, autonomy trial, and this is likely to be true for most tau trials, you want to pick people with amyloid pathology, because that's really early, and you want to pick people with the right amount of tau pathology, so they need to be A plus T plus. That's less than 5% of people that are in the right age, the asymptomatic group. So that's a very small number. So if you think it, if you want to recruit, let's say, an arbitrary figure, a thousand people, you need to screen a very large number of people to get that 4.3%. If you're doing that with um, PET imaging, you better have very, very deep pockets. In all honesty, deep pockets are not actually going to help you that much because there isn't the probably, even with the wonderful things we heard that's been done in the UK in terms of the PET MR system, there probably isn't enough PET chemistry in the world that would feed a few of these clinical trials in industry if that was what we were doing. So we need a non-invasive blood test for AD pathology. And the amazing thing is, that's popped up just at the time that we need it. As you all know, there has been some tremendous advances in blood-based um, assays, in particular for tau. So again, my colleague Hartmut Kolb uh, has generated what, clearly I'm biased here, but what we think 
And that is based not just on, you know, we'd like it to be true, but on the actual data that other people have produced, what appears to be one of the best, if not the best, of these predictive blood-based biomarkers. It's P217, uh, it functions really, really well. And by the way, we're not going to keep this to ourselves. Uh, we're busy uh, trying to make this uh, into a, a, a platform that would allow the field to use it if that's what you want to do. And we, we don't, uh, we're not a biomarker company, let me just say that. So we, interestingly, and in, in, incredibly really, the, uh, the P217 recognizes, or at least predicts, central pathology, not only of tau, but also of amyloid, which is really interesting because not all of the phosphor tau antibodies do that. I'd be really interested in finding out why, and we're sort of looking at that. But for now, this single blood test enables us to identify people with tau pathology and amyloid pathology. So it's really good at predicting these, and it correlates really well with uh, PET imaging. You see actual data from Hartmouth here, uh, the correlation um, with both um, uh, amyloid and with tau pathology. So, for tau trials, and that's our leading clinical program in Alzheimer's disease, we think we are already in the place where we can and actually are, in late development, executing true precision medicine using molecular biomarkers, both molecular imaging and molecular fluid phase biomarkers, uh, in a clinical trial. And I genuinely, when I started working in biomarker space, which was probably about 20 years ago, I honestly never thought we'd quite reach that. In fact, five years ago, I didn't think we'd reach it, and we're there. It's, it's done. Now, there's discussion about which of these biomarkers you should use, and I'm sure every company has a slightly different view. Every academic probably does, but we are there. We're using it. So we're using our blood-based diagnostic to help with screening, with diagnosis, with identifying the right patient in our screening program, and we're using PET analytics for actual uh, clinical trial entry, uh, for staging, and also to measure disease progression and to measure the therapeutic effect of our compound. We're using it, in effect, as a bit of a target engagement type marker. In other words, if we don't shift the change in tau spread with our compound, the compound is not engaging with the target in the way that we expect it will. So, that's what I wanted to say about uh, the today. Just a brief look for our tomorrow. So first of all, what we've got is nowhere near good enough, especially for clinical outcomes, which are really important to patients. So we're using our clinical trials to explore what we might do in the future. We're particularly interested in digital biomarkers. We're concentrating on speech because speech is an early change, an early cognitive change in Alzheimer's disease that's very well justified from the literature. Um, we've got lots of experience in this space. So my colleagues, led by Gail Wittenberg in data science, have been exploring using clinical trials, including, for example, IMI radar, which some of you may have been involved in, a, an approach which we called Revere, which is now working with a company called Humor on an app. And we've got lots of data from concurrent clinical trials as well as public-private consortium like IMI radar. We are using it already in our autonomy trial as part of a pilot in 20 sites. Just want to draw your attention here to the light green bar. On the left-hand side is the numbers of people that have to come into a clinic uh, for full screening to get 84 people. So without the digital biomarker, 1,400 people have to actually be with the screening team to get 84. But when we use this uh, digital type approach, we can reduce that to 560. So 560 to 84 is a pretty good number for a screening process, which we can do. Um, it also, here's just some data to show that the speech 
uh, deficit, as it were, or what we can pick up with the app, does correlate with um, both tau pathology and with amyloid pathology. We need biomarkers beyond the A and the T and the N. We need biomarkers for all of these things. And I think that there's a lot of evidence that they're on their way, but there are some really outstanding clinical trials that are helping us get there. I want to draw attention to, uh, yep. Uh, I want to draw attention to some work that um, Laura Winchester in Oxford is doing, looking at biomarkers for uh, Parkinson's disease. This is fairly early, but a very large study done across the UK, including with the Oxford Parkinson's disease cohort and tracking PD. What Laura has shown is that using proteomics, you can see a signal in, in blood, which replicates a signal that was derived first in brain and confirmed in CSF. It's looking really promising. Is it good enough right now? Is it ready to go? Absolutely not. But when we started in doing blood-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, nobody thought there would be a signal. And what really shifted the dial, I think, was when a number of teams began to show, actually, there is a signal in blood. Let's now find what the marker is that's driving that signature. And I think uh, Laura's study that was published at almost exactly the same time as a study that uh, came out of PPMI led by Novartis and another colleague of mine, uh, Fiona Elwood. And in fact, there's another paper, um, I think just about to come out or maybe just published in the last week, all showing pretty much the same thing, there is a signal. But I think one of the most interesting studies is a DPUK study, the Deep and Frequent Phenotyping Study. Since the Deep and Frequent Phenotyping Study was established, there are lots of Deep and Frequent Phenotyping Studies. So I'd like to propose from this podium that the uh, name of the study is changed to the RFDFP. That's the really, I'm not going to say the next word, Deep and Frequent Phenotyping, because it really, really is. And I think, Rob, I think you've got a lot to... Um, thank for this study because it actually came out of a meeting that I, I, my memory serves me right, it's quite a long time ago, you called in a hotel in Croydon that put a bunch of us together, locked us away for a couple of days and said, you know, it's a really difficult area, come up with a solution. And the first day was, you know, it was great fun and really interesting, but, you know, uh, cut to the... the Spoiler alert, we didn't come up with a solution, but I distinctly remember, it's really salient for me, Ian uh, Chessel stand, from AZ standing up and saying, listen, the problem is not that, and you said this in the opening, it's not that we haven't got enough uh, compounds or targets, it's that the trials are too long, too expensive, too difficult to choose, and I've got to choose one compound, and it, it just doesn't work, so we just don't do many of them. So out of that... And again, Paul Matthews here helped a lot. A group of us came up with a deep and frequent phenotyping. The problem with biomarkers is that everybody has their sort of favorite approach and they trial that favorite approach. And typically they'll measure a biomarker uh, once in a study or maybe once every couple of years or something like that. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not good enough. So in this study, the idea was you do pretty much everything you can think of and you do it as often as you possibly can in about a period of a clinical trial, 12, 18 months, something like that. It's a very difficult study to do. The first learning point is that participants can be found and have every one of these incredibly difficult you know, intervention studies uh, measures. It, their, their participant um, adherence rate is astonishingly good. I think Vanessa Raymond uh, and Jen Lawson, both here today, have done so much with many of you to really get this program moving. I can't wait. It's really exciting with all of these measures being done multiple different times. Recruitment was difficult, but post-COVID is really picking up. I think this this looks like this is going to be a real a ground changer program. Again, that's not enough. I just want to briefly tell you about something uh, that we're doing in Janssen. First, there's the Pharma Proteomics Project in UK Biobank, 50,000 people having in-depth proteomics uh, brought together by Chris Whelan, again, another one of my colleagues. And this is the first time anybody's heard about this. We've established something that we've called the Global Neurodegenerative Diseases Proteomics Consortium, the GMPC, will go 
public properly with it at ADPD, um, but we've put together, together with Gates Ventures and all the various uh, logos that you see there, what I think is probably the world's biggest proteomics data set for neurodegeneration. In AD and PD, we have 26,000 samples included, all measuring 7,000 proteins, over 100 million different protein assays. And we hope to double that over the next couple of years. This is a pharma-led public-private consortium. Um, let me skip that aside for space and just, I think the other thing that the field needs is access to uh, samples and the IHI, what used to be IMI, EPND, European Platform for Neurodegenerative Diseases, is one to call out. I'll sort of skip over the sides and just tell you the, the basic story is that uh, you can access through EPND samples that are sitting in freezers all over Europe in different cohorts. So not just accessing data, but now accessing samples. So I'll finish just by saying we already know that AD biomarkers are enabling regulatory decision making. And that is going to become more widespread and become increasingly nuanced, but more informative over the next few years. Our trials in Janssen are using molecular biomarkers for screening, participant inclusion, and efficacy outcomes, not effectiveness, efficacy. And we're exploring digital markers, and I think this is going to follow for PD as well. There are challenges ahead, but collaborative studies, including those led by pharma, as well as more conventional public-private consortia, as well as being led by um, MRC and DPUK, are really changing the ground space so that we can all make more rapid progress in this important field. Thanks to many, many people who gave me great slides. Thank you so much. Have I talked too much? Normal talk, perfect timing, and it allows us. If you're willing to take some questions? Yeah, of course. Fantastic. You can put your hand up clearly. It's rather hard to see. Yes, gentleman here in, in the beige top. Okay. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are about how or whether this more precision approach to clinical trials in dementia and you know, other disease areas whether that's going to feed through to clinical effectiveness and whether there is evidence that that is the case or not, um, or whether, as you sort of touched on at the beginning with the, the, the pitfalls of many of these cognitive assessments, whether actually even if you are reaching the right patients uh, who have the right pathology, whether we're really going to be able to see that clinical effectiveness um, yeah, in clinical trials. So, okay. It's such an important question. Essentially, your question is, are any of these biomarkers surrogates? I am not going to comment on the amyloid trials. If I said it was controversial, that would be another understatement. So forgive me for not mentioning. I'll, I'll, I'll restrict myself to the tau data in our field. We do not know whether the molecular markers, either imaging or blood-based that we are using, would be readouts for effectiveness. We don't know that today. We would not claim that today they are surrogates. However, I've worked in the tau space for over 30 years. Everything I know about tau, that the field knows about tau, suggests that they should be. And I would say that that preclinical evidence and indeed observational clinical evidence for tau is very, very large indeed, and in very considerable contrast to amyloid. Doesn't mean that amyloid is not a surrogate, it just means that the preclinical evidence, observational human and uh, animal studies and in vitro studies, all point to these being potential surrogate markers. However, I think that has to be proved, and I suspect we'll see regulatory authorities and um, payer authorities becoming increasingly attentive 
to whether that has actually been proved. We will go ahead and do the studies and the work that are necessary to show whether they are or whether they're not. If they're not surrogates, they still remain incredibly valuable for target engagement and for decision-making in clinical trials. If they become surrogates, then that would be a very important step forward for the field. But work is needed. And I, I think, so my strong feeling is it behoves uh, the pharmaceutical industry to do that work, to do our homework properly. Thank you.